Hi guys, welcome to Learn Electronics Repair. This is a uh, modulator, this thing. It's a quad DVBT modulator. So in here you connect up to four AV sources, satellite boxes, whatever. This is standard definition. And out here comes one or F frequency with the four channels on. So it creates a digital multiplex with four channels on the same carrier frequency. And that goes into the TV system. This is from a hotel. They have 110 apartments at the hotel. And they have a lot of different nationality of TV in the various rooms. Some of these they can receive directly from satellite and use transmodulators, which effectively convert directly from the satellite signal to a digital TV terrestrial signal. Some are local TV stations from terrestrial TV. And some are satellite boxes with subscription cards in or IPTV boxes connected into these. So they have two of these. One of them's working, but this one stopped working. And the problem with this one, it boots up, I'll show you in a moment, but we get no RF coming out of it, no UHF frequency. Um, I'll just show you, you can have a look, so we'll just put the power onto this. Okay, you can see it's lighting up, you can see Mac starting. Okay. And you can see it's set to 538 megahertz. I think this is channel 28 or something like that on the UHF band. And I know I have no signal. I was checking with the TV they had there. And basically I could do a diagnostic scan. And when it got to channel 28, it told me there was no signal on that one. So all four channels coming through this box are off. And they have quite a few guests complaining yeah, because you can't watch TV of their own nationality. So, two options really. One is to replace this, the other one is to repair this. The problem with replacing it is these are obsolete. You can't get these anymore. I do know where there is one. They cost you quite a bit of money used. The last one I replaced, I got a used one. I think it cost me about 500 euros or something for a used one, yeah. But if I replace this with something else, then it causes an even bigger problem because, for example, I could use four individual modulators from HDMI or from standard definition into four digital modulators, but that would then give me four channels on different frequencies. Now, it's not a problem to have one channel per frequency because there's quite a lot of uh, bandwidth on the UHF band still left there. The problem is that if I replace this with something else, then the technicians at the hotel have got to go to all 110 rooms and retune all the TVs. And because the place is full of guests, that's not easy to do. So it becomes quite a logistical problem to do it. Okay. And also that costs money. I mean, you know, to pay somebody to go 110 rooms to scan every TV back and well, work it out for yourselves. You're probably going to take them a couple of days or something. And they're busy anyway. So the upshot is it's better if I can actually repair this one or just get another one of the same type and program it to the same settings. But the menus are working. I can go to the menus on this so I can actually... Uh, Go into the various menu settings. You can see if I think we press the button. Yeah, general settings and so on. So I can actually set this. It's not a problem. The thing seems to work. It's just literally that it doesn't give any RF output. Other than that, I think it's actually probably working. So let's open this up. Have a look what's inside this and see if we can do anything with it. Okay, I've got the uh, back panel off. It was just held on by a load of screws. And we can actually see straight away there's some corrosion here. I don't know if that's related to the problem or not. One thing I will mention with this is that the connections on here, so we have an RF in and an RF out. These actually pass through the signal from the previous modulators of 
and from the terrestrial TV antenna. So the signal is going through here okay. It's just not adding on the extra frequency with these channels. So that may suggest that at least part of the circuitry inside the module is okay. But it may be that the in and out are just literally connected to each other. So let's have a look. So we'll go from uh, in to out on resistance range. This is the connection coming in, going out. And yeah, they just connect to each other. So they don't go through any circuitry inside here, which basically means that when it's adding on the additional frequency with these channels, it literally just appears on the whole system, forwards and backwards, basically. Okay. So, that doesn't really give us any clues. This corrosion, though. Yeah. I'm thinking that this connector may be where the power comes in. So, this under here is the PSU. Okay, and there's a multi-way connector here. I don't see any other connections down this side but there again it could well be just on a ribbon cable I'll try and clean this up then let's have a better look at it So I don't really think that was anything particularly, just a bit of dust maybe, or a bit more isopropyl. Yeah, so that just appears to be dust. Okay, so I think we're going to have to remove this entire PCB and get a better idea of what we have on the other side of here. Well, guys, this thing doesn't seem to be quite so easy to take apart as I thought. I kind of assumed that these connectors would just effectively pull through, but they're actually part of the housing, so it can't happen that way. You can see they are soldered down here. There's another row over there, but I'm just looking at this down this gap, if you can see. And I've lifted this out so far, there's a connector down there, so I think that actually connects to the other row of phone or RCA socket so I'm fairly confident if I just unsolder these this will actually come out it looks like each of these fits into like a slot in the board yeah so hopefully that slot goes all the way through I don't think there's any total bit of good in the lifting this way it kind of scrunched a little bit so I stopped moving it but let's try to unsolder these and see if this will come off that way so I'll try first with adding solder and then braid. Let's see if this works. Well, it takes solder easily enough. Does the braid remove that? I might add a bit of flux if it doesn't work first time. Yeah, I think that actually looks to me like it's now no longer soldered. Yeah, so this looks like this will actually do the job. It's an interesting way of doing it, not as bad as it looks to be quite honest. It shouldn't take long to get this off. I will add a bit of flux. That's overrated. <laughs> flux is overrated. <laughs> That's Detlef's motto, flux is overrated. Any t-shirts with that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a bit more added solder, let's see.
Yeah. Just one more. Still got a grip here. There we go. This was a ribbon cable that did go to the power supply. That's where we had the uh, corrosion or dust on that side of it. I could connect this back up and just check to see what voltages I have and I may well do so. But first I'm just going to have a look to see if I can determine how many voltage rails there are on this. So assuming these are ground, these metal cans, so we'll have a look to see how many of these pins go to ground. Well that one does. Yeah, so it looks like we've got five pins all going to ground. Those four and this one. So how many of the ones are actually connected to each other? Well, those two are. But not to these three. These three connected to each other as well. No, so there's four. Well, those are a pair. And then there's one, two, three. So there is four possible voltage rails on this. Okay, so I think I may have to reconnect that ribbon cable just to have a look to see what's on all these pins. That gives an idea if we actually do have all the voltages or not. There's a uh, CMOS battery, but I'm guessing it, that is okay because it doesn't seem to lose its settings when it's powered down. The channel settings. Well, actually, that reads. Unless it's this. Ah, oh, this could be the ground end. This is positive. Well, it only reads 1.1 volts. It may be that the settings are in some non-volatile memory somewhere on here that doesn't need a battery backup. It could be that's the case. But that is a bit low. Could be a 1.2 volt battery, I guess. I'm not sure what it actually is. Mm, 1.12. don't see any markings on it. I don't really want to remove it in case then I lose all the settings that are in this. Okay, but it does seem a bit low. It's not like a normal CR2032, so it could be something else, I guess. And then this is the RF or UHF output, so it looks like we have signal path through here here to here I can see this bit and then from here into here so there are some transistors up here or MOSFETs there's some chip here now the RF in isn't used on this this is just output because it gets the input from those RCA connectors so while we're here, let's just have a look. Yeah, you can see the pass through there. So this is the RF coming in and going out. And then this is like a transformer winding. So that just passes the signal through. And then I think we can say that this is ground. Please go to there. yeah this is ground so these are probably capacitor or something like that looks like we have a capacitor and a resistor actually to stop that from wobbling or stop breathing okay 820 ohms so the signal looks like it comes in from here if this is a transistor based collector emitter so collector driving the output sort of makes sense to me at least and then, yeah, this is like an inductor to ground. So this is just driving this coil effectively. But that's to ground, it seems. Well, maybe this isn't a collector then. Yeah, it goes to there. Oh, where's this go to? Goes to that. Is that ground? Yeah, that's ground. 
Is she's ground? I'm not totally sure at the moment where this gets power from because this is ground, but I'm no expert on RF circuitry like this, I'll be honest. But this is ground. You'd think this has power from somewhere. Can't be there. It's ground and these go to ground. Hmm, interesting. Let's just see how this thing reads. Is it like a transistor? So have a look. If it was NPN, but it may be PMP. Oh, if it was PMP, then this end would be ground. Probably the power would come in here somewhere, but I think that might be a capacitor. No, that reads short. Okay, what do we have here? So I'm thinking if it's possibly PMP here. That reads, I'll show you. It reads uh, 1.8 volts. What about this one? Two. Go the other way. That reads like a transistor. That doesn't. Are these devices identical? Let's have a look. Yeah, so these are both marked L8 and then the funny something or other in 4.2. I would look for these by searching for SMD code L8 and then SOT23, which is this package. Another one here, one FW, but just looking at this now, these are two points are connected together. That probably is a resistor, it looks a bit more of a grey colour now. So here, and that comes from the output of here. So it looks like this and those may be connected together. What's that resistor read? This thing. Let's go to Ohm's range. It's very low resistance, like uh, one ohm or less, okay? I'm just trying to figure out how this actually is working. It looks like maybe something coming in here. Just go back to this chip somewhere. No, it goes here. And then through a resistor to there. Okay, these these IEC code. You have to whip them up. Six six is the digit. Then B will specify some sort of multiplier. These are all connected together. Is this ground? Yes, that's ground. Then we have one, and then these. So it looks sort of like this is something to do with that and then possibly that is something to do with these. But these two are identical, so I'd be interested to see if they read the same as each other. Obviously you can't necessarily say because they are um, in circuit, but this is the red metal lead, black. Reads like a diode, other ones are the way up, so red here. Reads like a diode, and then from here to here, which you think is base emitter. Okay, two volts all there, but let's go the other way. That reads different, but there again, I mean, it may just be how they are on circuit. This is red lead to here. Okay, and then we're going to same on the other one. Leads completely different. Let's go black lead to here. So I think this is ground. We'll need to it. To here. 
that reads like an all junction also okay yeah those both read like diode junctions and then on the other one the black lead to here do these read like diode junctions yes yes so they basically look very much like each other let's see if we can find a data sheet for these this one as well how's this one reading Let's have a look. It reads like a diode. It reads like a diode, okay. I can see diode junctions there that make some sense. And let's even find this chip. So it's an ST. It might be this number, that might be a date code, but let's have a look. Well, I googled then, as I said, L8, SOT23, SMD code, brings me to smanuals.com, and we see some codes here, L8, L8. Now, that one says SOD323, that's the package. This one is SOT23. These are, again, something else. So, it looks like... Well, you can even hover over them, yeah. So it looks like it might be that one. Now, this says it's a current regulated diode. I'm not totally sure what that is, but it looks like it has an anode and a cathode. Is that another anode? Short lead two to cathode lead three via circuit trace. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm reading kind of like a diode junction, two of them there and there. So I'm not totally convinced that is the part could be but i must admit i'm not familiar this looks almost like a unijunction transistor symbol oh he says it uses jfet techniques so maybe it is like a jfet well that's what i'm reading anyway across that and it may be that i can't see anything else instantly so who knows but maybe they're not transistors at all 1FW, just do a search. Okay, back into S manuals again. So you can see there are a few options here now that come in this package. We have MPN transistor, another MPN transistor, a P channel MOSFET, MPN. Dalton, that's a different package. MPN transistor. And these are 1F variables. Ah, 1FW itself. That one. Okay, you can see the pinout, standard pinout. So if this is an MPN transistor, which it says, you should see diode junction from here to here. Yeah, we do. Okay, so reads like an MPN transistor, probably is an MPN transistor, and it's probably okay. These both read the same as each other, could be with those current diode things, probably okay. So what's this thing? Okay, let's search for ST and then 2904. Eh, EEPROM. I don't think so. Don't see why an EEPROM would be in this position. Op amp. Well, possible because we have two inputs connected to ground. Yeah, maybe. Let's look for that other number. ST and then 60342. Okay. Oh, Lego. Circuit breaker. No. So about the only clue I have is it could be an LM2904. I'm not totally convinced that is actually 
the case, but it could be in one inverted and non inverted or connected to ground, sort of would make some sense, I guess. Okay, well, we can just start off with it being an op amp and let's try and measure some voltages around here, I think. Clearly, we don't have anything to go by at the moment. I'll check the power rails coming off this power supply. I don't know what this should be, but I'm interested to see if all the pins at least do have some sort of power on them. This is powering up, so you'd expect the power rails to be there, unless maybe there's a different power rail that goes to that RF circuit at the end. I'm not convinced that would be the case, but lack of anything else to go by, let's have a look. Yeah, nothing to lose by doing this. So I'll go, uh, this must be ground, I'm guessing here. Yeah, this must be ground. So what do we have on here? Let's have a look. So what's a 34 volt supply? I'm not surprised there's some high voltage supply in here. Nothing on here. We had quite a lot of pins that were actually ground. Appear to be these. That one. I think these two at the end both had the same supply on. Yeah. This looks like it's a 12 volt supply, or should be. That's wandering around a bit, you see it? Yeah, you see that? That moves around. This I think is the same, I think these two pins were connected to each other. Yeah, same problem with that, I'm assuming that's a problem. No, I think by the ground, no matter three more that could be supplies. That's a 28 volt. And that's uh, all the supplies on this seem to be wandering around a bit actually. Uh, and yeah, it is effectively booting up. That's a little bit surprising. Nothing wrong with my multimeter, is there? Let's just get back onto volts again. Well, you know, guys, you can always try another multimeter. Okay, volts range. I'll take a ground from like one of these things actually where it bolts to the chassis. That must be ground. What have we got? The same thing, yeah. So it looks to me like it's power supply has got some sort of problem. Let's open it up and have a look. Obviously, I don't know what supply rails I should have on this. I've never worked on one before. What's I wouldn't expect it to be doing that. Yeah, I think you would you agree with me there? That doesn't seem right. Whatever it's supposed to be doing, that doesn't seem to be correct to me. So let's have a look. How to get in at this thing. Couple more screws. Looks like a plastic clip here and here. But I'm not quite sure how that does come because these obviously go underneath there. Yeah. So let's have a look. Oh, that sort of pushes backwards. Okay. And that does the same thing. Oh, I missed a screw. Looks like this probably lifts up a little bit and this pushes back a bit. It's not pushing back far enough to get that under there, I have to say. Yeah. Maybe this top piece comes off. Yeah, that looks like it might come off. Maybe the whole thing comes off. Yeah, I've got it. So this clips up like so, and then probably comes back to come off, maybe release this little clip here, let's have a look, 
Mm. Well, I thought I had it just left upwards. It's coming off. Oh, that plastic clip stays there. This just comes out. Okay. So here's our power supply. First thing then, is there any high voltage in it? You would think because it's running, there probably isn't, but probably and definitely is not the same thing. This, I can see this is the power coming in. This will be a filter. Yeah, look, this must be four diodes. So this will be the plus and minus out of the bridge rectifier. So if we measure here, that is probably the capacity. Yeah, let's have a look. It looks that way. I can say this is a bridge rectifier. And there's about 16 volts in it. This is the negative end. This is the positive end. So yeah, about 16 volts slowly discharging. Because the power supply is running, you'd pretty much expect that to happen, to be quite honest. So it's not dangerous. How does this come off here? Let's clip out. Seems to be loose. There's something holding this just here. No, it's out, it's out. So we just take the uh, ribbon cable through. Okay. We have it. Oh, and look what we've got here. That's gone. These have definitely gone. Yeah. Gone, gone, gone. If there's other ones the same value and manufacture, which will look to be the same, probably change all of these. But I think this is the cause of our problem. This is definitely faulty, that's for sure. Uh, this will be the TL431 one, we're just down here, I guess. This will be the uh, regulation. Yeah, AZ431, same thing. Programmable Zener. This will be the output rectifier. There's your transformer, this is your switching transistor. This is the filter I could see on the input. Those are the four diodes I could see. That's the large capacitor. But I'm confident enough to say that if we change these, we might get somewhere with this. Let's see. So, this one 100 microfarad 50 volt, and that's another one I think of the same. No, 25 volt. So, actually, a different value to that one. This one. Always in the hardest position to see. That's another hundred. I can see these two. 680, 25, 680, 25. Okay, so let's get rid of these and this one. Those two are a different value. And I think if they're the same and they look okay, they may well be okay, actually. These certainly look okay. So, okay, these two and that one. I could use the desoldering gun on this, but I suspect it will be very easy with braid and probably quicker than even firing up the desoldering gun. Okay. So, get a finger behind the capacitor and move it in that direction. Pull this leg in. Yeah, it's moved. Then wait for that to solidify. Hit this, push it back. And I think you can probably see the capacitor starting to come out, yeah. So same thing again. Yeah, you see how it's moved now. This end. Okay. And then I can probably just heat both pins together and pull it out. Yeah. Okay. So white stripe negative goes to the negative. This isn't a wire or something that's pulled out. It's just a uh, solder. Yeah. Okay. Still some on there, that's that's what it is, it's just solder. Okay. Clean this up. Yeah. OK. 
Okay. So this one now, well actually I'll take these two out, then we can see what that is. So have a look. These two are obviously in parallel on the same voltage rail. Okay. Same technique. Wall at this end, move the capacitor in this direction, then this end and push it the other way. Okay, and then again, finger behind it, warm this one towards me. That's basically out now. Just warm that, see, it fell out. So, this is your 680 25. See it's domed, we'll test them. We can test them. Okay, so same thing. Finger behind the capacitor, warm this end, move it towards me a little bit. Not too far, don't force it. This one away. This one forwards, that should just fall out. Okay. okay. The others actually look okay. 135 volt and 150 so these are actually different values this one again these are going to be different values i don't know how they always manage to put them in, in the direction that you can't read the value yeah they just always seem to be able to do that Is it this end? Okay, 47.25. 35 volts something or other, 47.35. So none of these are the same values as the one I actually removed, okay? 470.25. So I suspect it's probably just these three, and we'll know because we'll see if the power supply is actually stable. So this is a 220-25, let's measure it. Okay. Only reads 85, should be 220. We'll check the ESO in a minute. Uh, this one and the other one are 680.25s, let's have a look. 120 out of 680, not good here. Uh, this one. 680. A little bit worse, okay. ESR. Just zero at first. Zeroed. I think you said error, but I'm sure it was zeroed. Oh, oh error less than one ohm. That's the tolerance, <laughs> if you like. Okay. The resolution of the meter. Let's see. Yeah, 7.76. That's really bad. This one. Yeah, very similar. Not quite as bad, but bad enough. Okay, so different schools of thought, really. You could just say, change all the capacitors. You wouldn't be wrong. You could say, change these three and then see if it's stable. You wouldn't be wrong. Different ways to work. And really, it's down to what you feel like. Maybe down to a bit of experience. So let's just clean these holes and replace these three. And now let's see where the, the power supply is working properly. Can't see any uh, 680-25s that would actually fit. I've got some poles here. These are uh, 1,025. Actually, just fine, I would have thought. These things won't be critical at all. 
This one is marked 105 cc, same as the other one. Doesn't say where we SO, but there again, neither do the original ones. Let's have a look to see what we have. So this one. Yeah, it reads about 9.30. And I've got another one, different brand, but another 105 degree, 1025. Okay, what's this one read? Yeah, a thousand actually. Let's look at the ESR of these ones. So that's very low ESR. Actually, if you hit zero, just change the uh, range. Yeah, 0.13. That's nice, low ESR capacity. This one. Yeah, fine. Quite happy with both of those. So I'll put those two in. I'll find a replacement for the other one and then let's see what happens. Okay, so capacitor's changed. Just uh, check this to see. First of all, if it powers on and then we can look for the voltages. Stop these screws going from underneath it. Just, uh, yeah, it's all fine. Right, let's power it up again. Well, it's starting, so it's behaving like it did before, pretty much. Yeah, booting. Yeah, so that's doing the same thing. What voltages do we see on the connector now? Well, let's have a look. So, I think this was the one that was around 12 volt wandering, now it's 12 volts. Okay, I think these four were all ground, and then we add some grounds and some voltages. That's a plus 32, looks much more sensible now. That's a plus 20. Oh, that's going on and off. Unless that's had a bad connection, no. That is just going on and off, maybe it should do. That's a plus 24. So this one, now it doesn't go on and off. Maybe it was switching itself on and off for some reason. The controller still displaying that. Let's see if this is working. What I don't have at the moment is a portable TV that I actually can tune in. I've got one, but I've lost the remote. I just don't know where it is. Probably here somewhere. But let's see if this will help. So this is a Spectrum Analyzer. And I'm just thinking, I've stuck a bit of wire into the, well, it's actually a resistor, but a bit of wire into there. That's the RF output. I'll put the antenna somewhere in that general direction. And if I switch this on and we see a spike, I think we can say that I'm touching the RF. And you see this spike here, this one. That's saying it's at 536 megahertz here. Okay, can you see it? 536, and this is set to 538. So I would say, yeah, 539. So I'd say this is working. Switch it off. Yeah, that's gone away. So although I don't have a TV, I know that he's outputting RF now in the right frequency. So I'm confident enough to take this back on site and see if it now works. So I'll make arrangements to do that. And if I get the chance, I'll take you guys there. You can have a look at this place. It's quite interesting.